we talk about different you know, political outcomes. And you know, over the long run, uh, Great Britain becomes a, uh, remains a constitutional monarchy. And even in the 19th century, when Victoria uh, had great, uh, great prestige, um, she did not have great power. Uh, and the Netherlands also resisted absolutism, and the Dutch Republic uh, uh, remained the Dutch Republic, although for reasons that we'll see later, uh, the Dutch Republic uh, ceases to be a, a great power uh, in the 18th century. So uh, given the, the very different route that Prussia and Austria and Russia and Sweden and France went uh, with uh, a centralization of absolute rule, why did it work out so differently for uh, England slash Britain uh, and, and the Netherlands? So we just want to, again, this is a, the second and last of these sort of holding pattern lectures. This parallels exactly what you're reading. Uh, because again, we're, we're, until we get our class set and all that, and then uh, it'll be a very different kind of lecture starting on, uh, what's day, Wednesday or Monday? Uh, uh, next Monday. Uh, so, but let's just think aloud about what these places had in common and what this tells you about, uh, uh, about social structure and political outcomes in early modern Europe. And, and of course, the consequences are enormous uh, for other kinds of outcomes. Let me give you an example. Uh, Germany uh, is not unified until 1871. Uh, uh, ironically, uh, unification proclaimed in the, in the Hall of Mirrors uh, at the Chateau of Versailles, which we'll visit for a few seconds uh, later on. Uh, and the fact that Germany, German unification was achieved by Prussia, and that Prussia was dominated by nobles, who were called Junkers, you'll come to them later, uh, and by an army uh, which, in which the state basically was an appendage of the army, had rather enormous consequences for, uh, for Europe uh, in the, the late 19th and, and above all in the, in the 20th century. Uh, so in the 1960s and 1970s, people paid a lot more attention to social structure uh, and, and uh, you know, sort of class analysis. But, but you know, when you look at Britain, the uh, experience of Britain uh, and uh, the Dutch Republic, they do share things that, that, that uh, uh, in a way determine the kind of uh, uh, political economy uh, that they would have. So what, you know, what are some of these things that I've, I've written up on the board uh, uh, there, but let's just start uh, not necessarily, uh, well, I guess, uh, uh, yeah, I guess in, in that order and just kind of think aloud. And then what I'm gonna do uh, the last 20 or 25 minutes is talk about the Dutch Republic. And so you could skip that part in the reading, which isn't very long. And again, illustrate uh, with some paintings that you, for which you're not responsible, but just to make the points I want to make about uh, the nature of the Dutch Republic and which we'll see, you'll see w in ways in which it was very similar to England slash Great Britain and very different uh, in terms of, of, uh, of France. Uh, so first of all, um, it's not a coincidence that in both England and in uh, the Dutch Republic you had, uh, uh, along with Northern Italy, the city-states of Northern Italy, you had the largest percentage of, uh, of, of middle-class population that you could find in Europe. Uh, that in, if the, if the middle class in, in, in Russia, uh, which I'll talk about on Monday, was just absolutely minuscule, uh, the, the, the middle class was extremely small in, in Prussia, uh, Prussia did not include you know, the Hanseatic League cities, such as uh, it's Bremen and, 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 and Hamburg and, and, and the others. Uh, so you, you have in, in the Netherlands and uh, in England an astonishingly large uh, middle class. Moreover, moreover uh, in, in the case of England, uh, there was a, a tremendous fluidity between elites. Uh, that the percentage of the population who was noble uh, who had noble titles, was extremely small. Uh, uh, privilege uh, came from wealth, and wealth was uh, uh, stemmed from the land, yet uh, because of the rapid and dramatic expansion of the English role in the global economy, uh, you had lots of very wealthy landlorder, landlords, uh, property owners, investing in commerce, uh, whereas in uh, in Spain uh, and in, in France and in Prussia in particular, it was seemed to be sort of a, a, a slumming uh, for uh, nobles to participate in commerce. Now that, you know, Marxist analysis has given us this, this all too rigid 
uh, a picture of the nobility sort of letting their nails grow long and, and uh, they, they are nobles because they do nothing. That was part of it. Certainly there were nobles in France and, uh, who bought up vineyards in, 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 uh, around Bordeaux. Uh, there are nobles in Toulouse, who, who, around Toulouse, who have great uh, invest in commercial agriculture, but yet the fact remains uh, that it's really in England uh, that you have this tremendous fluidity between within the elite uh, and that uh, you know basically commercial money talks uh, uh, as much as property uh, money talks. Um, London uh, already by the late 16th century, one sixth of all the people, I think this is Tony Wrigley, E.A. A. E. A. Wrigley who pointed this out a long time ago, one sixth of all the people in England went to London frequently, frequently. Well, uh, whereas this would, this would, because London was absolutely, you know, gi gigantic as a city. The only cities in Europe that were comparable, and they were smaller, were Naples, uh, extraordinarily poor uh, city, and, and uh, Constantinople, Istanbul, uh, and of course in Japan, Edo, uh, which would become uh, known as Tokyo. And so the percentage of the English population that would have considered themselves to be you know, middle class is extraordinarily large. Now the same is even more uh, true in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, there were, to be sure, nobles in the Netherlands. Uh, they tended to live in the eastern part in rural uh, uh, Netherlands uh, and in the south, uh, but their lives and their interests were far, far away from, the, 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 from that economic uh, 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 large machine, uh, which was Amsterdam, and Amsterdam uh, is dominated by the middle classes. Now, the middle class want political rights. They want prerogatives. They want their privileges for themselves. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, it, it is fair to, to, to argue that, that non-titled people in England uh, were at the uh, forefront of uh, the victorious uh, um, role in the Civil War that Parliament uh, played. Now, uh, in, in the city-states of, 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 of Venice, and, and of, uh, which was a, a major trading city already on the decline, and in Florence, and, and in Milan, and in Turin, and places like that, uh, you, you find something very comparable, but, but these are the, Italy is not united until the 1860s. Uh, so northern Italy has a, uh, has a, a large percentage of the population who are, 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 are middle class, but, but in talking about the political outcomes of, of states, uh, that's... Uh, uh, it doesn't really fit into our analysis here. Um, now, part of that is that along with Northern Italy, uh, the Netherlands and, um, and, and England uh, slash Great Britain have uh, uh, by far the most urbanized uh, population uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, that if you go into Serbia, for example, what now is Serbia, I mean, there basically was Belgrade, which was a small place. Uh, Poland had uh, very lively, important cities, uh, 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 Warsaw and, and, and Krakow, uh, and some other, uh, uh, Gdansk as well. Uh, uh, so you can't just say, well, in Eastern Europe there weren't cities, but there isn't any place, uh, including France, uh, that had uh, remotely uh, as high as percentage of the population living in cities uh, as uh, England uh, and, and the Netherlands. And one of the great shifts in English history, English-British history, that you, that you, you know, become aware uh, is the shift of economic dynamism in England uh, away from the south to the north uh, in the time we're starting this course in the 17th century, besides London, which is this gigantic place, uh, the biggest cities in England were, were Norwich and, and Exeter, uh, and then York uh, in the north. And of course, with a large scale industrialization, uh, which begins uh, in the middle of the 18th century, you, you'll see this dramatic shift up to the north. And then of course, Manchester, which was a small town, becomes this uh, uh, enormous city and Liverpool becomes ever more important. Um, but you know, cities are, are where the middle class lives. And, and, and bourgeois, you know, and burghers, as I said last time, come from, you know, these are urban residents who, who, who are losing their privileges on the continent to big time absolute states. Uh, and uh, they will defend quite vociferously their privileges as, as uh, townspeople against uh, pretensions, absolutist pretensions of, 
of, of nobles in the, in the case of, of, of the Netherlands and also to an extent in England as well. So th they share those things in common, which is not to say that a country like France wasn't, uh, wasn't urbanized because France, because uh, Paris is already enormous. There are 500,000 people about at the time of the French Revolution. Uh, there's so many people you can't count because they own nothing. And also we don't have really accurate censuses until uh, the 19th century. The first accurate census I think is in, in, in Copenhagen. Uh, in the end of the, uh, of the 18th century. And most censuses were taken, by the way, as a way of counting heads, uh, the number of people who had to be fed at the time of a siege. So we, we're, we're kind of guessing on, on, on these population figures. Uh, but uh, um, the fact remains that, that the, the Netherlands and, and England, Britain, uh, share uh, this. And th this, this is important in, in terms of, of, of political outcomes and also important in, in the case of England, Britain, uh, in uh, uh, what we've come to call uh, the Industrial Revolution, which I will talk about, uh, uh, talk about at another time. Um, secondly, as I tried to suggest the other day, uh, that uh, you know, these places, uh, 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 they, they resist absolutism. Uh, that the English Civil War, it's a kind of a generalization to, uh, to make that, to, to, to underline that too much, but, but nonetheless, the uh, people um, I living in, uh, in England in the 1640s uh, uh, saw that th there was a real threat to uh, the idea of the freeborn Englishman uh, that was coming from, uh, uh, from the trampling of, 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 of long assumed rights since at least the 13th century, at least in the imagination uh, of, uh, uh, of people uh, by, uh, by kings who wanted to dispense with, with the rights of parliament and run things as, uh, as they wanted to. Um, and in the case of, of the Netherlands, it's the same thing. I mean, the, the, uh, the, there isn't anything as dramatic as the English Civil War, but the important kind of outcome is that in the end, this decentralized federalist structure, uh, which I describe in the book, and we'll talk a little bit about in a while, uh, uh, is victorious over the pretensions of a potential dynastic ruling house, that is the Orange, House, the House of Orange, uh, who would wanted to make the chief Dutch official, who was called the Stadtholder, you can re read that in, uh, 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 in the book, and wanted to turn that person into kind of a thundering uh, semi-absolutist monarch. And that doesn't work as well. Uh, and when you think of the origins of the Netherlands, the origins of the Netherlands comes from a civil war, a, 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 war, ag or a war of independence, against the Spanish absolutist state that begins in when? 1572 and goes on and off all the time until Dutch independence is uh, recognized. It was a fait accompli for a long time, but until the Dutch independence was recognized in 1648 at the Treaty of Westphalia. So for the Dutch, when they imagine you know, scary things, a scary thing is an army sent by uh, um, sent by uh, uh, the king of Spain uh, to extract more taxes from the wealthiest of all the Spanish pro uh, uh, provinces, that is the Netherlands, rich because of commerce, and as we'll see in a minute, to try to force people to remain Catholics at a time when the vast majority of the Dutch population had converted to Calvinism. And so, the, the, in the, in the, 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 those people who believed in the Dutch Republic, which is the vast majority of the people, uh, uh, just as people, the majority of the population of England who held to the rights of Parliament, they have this sort of scary scenario of their rights being violated, trampled upon, destroyed, eliminated, eradicated by big time absolute rulers. And the other scary thing for the Dutch is of course, you know, the big guy down south. Uh, because uh, uh, Louis XIV would love to control all of, of, of the Netherlands. And his invasions w at one time are turned by back when they literally opened the dikes and flood the uh, French armies back. And so, you know, in, in the, 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 um, the, the mental construction of, of the Dutch and the English both involves one thing they don't want to be, and that is to lose their prerogatives, their rights to an absolute state. And in both cases, this becomes part of their self-identity. That's an essential part, as my good friend Linda Colley who used to teach here, and sadly is no, not here anymore, she's at Princeton, uh, that she made in her argument, uh, uh, made an argument in her very successful book called Britons, The Construction of British Identity. Uh, and I will argue later in the course, in 1848, it has to get reinvented again 
by imagining an other who is perceived as sneaky and dangerous, and of course in that case it's the French, but also from the point of view of the British, the Irish, who are conceived of as perceived of as being capable because of their quest for not only to be trampled by the, by the English, directly by English Protestants, uh, of hooking up with, uh, with France, which they tried to do in 1798, uh, or in World War I with Germany, uh, because there were some attempts of the Germans to, to uh, stoke up Irish independence movements. So again, the only point here is that they see themselves as abs anti-absolutist, and this helps them create this, this sense of identity, which helps determine their political, uh, uh, their political origins. And, and, and you'll find nothing comparable in, in Russia, obviously, which I'll come back and talk about, or in Prussia, uh, or in France. You can talk about the origins of French nationalism in the middle of, of the 18th century, but it's very closely tied to this dynasty, at least until they lop off the guy's head you know, in 1793. Uh, so, okay, so that's sort of that, that point. Um, third is um, de decentralization. Uh, is that both of these states are decentralized states. The British don't have a police force until one, 1827 or 29, I can't remember which, when Robert Peel creates a London police force, which they call the Bobbies, after, you know, like Robert Bob Bobbies, uh, and people didn't want that. They didn't want a large standing army. What do they identify large standing armies with? They always had to have a large standing navy for obvious reasons, but they identified large standing armies with France or with uh, the Spain of Philip II, or with Prussia, or with Russia. Uh, and so it didn't mean that the English state wasn't efficient in collecting taxes, because they were more efficient than the French were in collecting taxes. But it does mean that the, this decentralization is an essential part of who they thought they were. Uh, that the sheriff, the local sheriff, you know, he'll, he'll call out the guys and restore order when, uh, when there's trouble. But there's this real kind of, uh, of, of fear that, that the standing, large standing armies are, uh, you know, could ultimately compromise the rights of free-born Englishmen. And that's in, in a way that they would have put it. In the case of, uh, of the Netherlands, which I'll come back to in a while, uh, you have these provinces that, that although Amsterdam, though you know, Holland, which is the province of Amsterdam, is by far uh, the most important of the, of the pro uh, and most prosperous of, of, the, of the Dutch uh, uh, provinces, such as that we often miscall the Netherlands Holland, when in fact Holland is just one of the, uh, one of the provinces, it's, it's, if you call the United States New York or California. Uh, because those are the two most powerful states in, uh, uh, in the United States. Uh, but the sort of decentralized federalist structure is part of who they thought they were and who they continue to think they are. Um, and this is very different than, uh, uh, than, uh, uh, than these absolute kings who can send out their, their, uh, their armies, can run by their minions to squish whomever they want like grapes whenever there's trouble, and we can exaggerate the power of Philip, I mean of uh, Peter the Great, because in this vast empire that's expanding south and already expanding toward Siberia and such distant places, it took a long time to get the, get the, the, the guys there, but when they got there, there was hell to pay. Uh, very, very different than this, this federalist structure of a decentralized structure of, uh, of both of these countries, and the political outcome is, is different. Now, you can also make that argument, we don't, this isn't the course to do that, but you can make that argument uh, about the United States, and of course, the evolution of the United States, when they, when they, uh, because of the, of the, the local, the local uh, prestige of local leaders and the decentralized notion the nature of the colonies already at the time of the War of Independence, which is gonna have a strong, uh, you know, a, a, a strong uh, role in the political outcome, for better or for worse, uh, in this country, where you have this sort of wacko political system st that still exists because of, you know, people screaming states' rights and all that, but that's, a, that's, another, uh, that's another subject. Um, okay, fourth, you know, anti-Catholicism uh, in both cases. Why? Uh, uh, well, because these are, these are major, major countries in, 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 in the Reformation. Uh, that the, you know, the English Reformation, which begin, begins with Henry, Henry VIII, you know, uh, wanting to divorce his very, and kill his various wives, uh, you know, along the way, uh, still had an awful lot to do with resistance to the power of Rome uh, and the, the power of, uh, of the Catholic Church as an institution. In the case of the Netherlands, uh, anti-Catholicism is, is, is endemic. Why? Because it's identified with, with the Spanish Empire, uh, with Spain, which not only wanted to extract taxes and other 
further revenue from its most prosperous province, uh, but wanted to force people uh, to uh, remain Catholic. And when they send this guy called the Duke of Alba up to uh, uh, up to the Netherlands, I mean, he you know, burns people to the stake and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and so, uh, and the association of, of Catholicism as the dominant religion in, uh, in both of the, the enemy countries, that is France and, uh, um, uh, and Spain, uh, is extremely important. Now this is not to say that the Dutch don't fight the English too, because they do. There are various wars over, over you know, control of the seas. But nonetheless, in, uh, in the imagination of both of these, uh, or in the, in the metal, uh, Imaginero, but in the, in the mental sort of construction of these, uh, of these two countries, what we are not, that is Catholic, uh, helps, uh, helps define their, their identity. Of course, the particular problem of Ireland, or challenge of Ireland, as I suggested earlier, has an awful lot to do with that. And the reinvention in the 19th century of British identity will also have a lot to do with fear of the Irish. You know, the enemy within, as they were perceived, but more about that. I'll talk about that a lot, a lot and try to explain why there was no revolution in England uh, in, 18, uh, in 1848. And in the course of, of, uh, uh, in the course of, 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 of Britain, it's even clearer, I mean, because the French is, is, is uh, you know, this sneaky French. Uh, and, and from the, British, the, the French point of view, it's the perfidious Albion already there. And if, you, know, you can go all the way uh, you know, up to the origins of World War I, uh, uh, to see, uh, I mean, the, when the British uh, get into World War I is because of the violation of, of, uh, of Belgian neutrality by the Germans, because the idea of having another enemy, you've already got the French across the channel, and it's not that big a channel, you could swim across it. Uh, I couldn't, but, and you couldn't either, but as people have and do it all the time. Uh, but if you've got the Germans in Ostend eating moule frites, uh, you know, eating you know, mussels with French fries, and you've already got the French there, this is unthinkable. So they go, they go, they go to war, or finally are going to go to war. Uh, so, you know, this, I don't want to exaggerate this too much, but the largest riots in, in Britain in the 18th century are not the riots for political reform at all. There are the anti-Catholic riots called the Gordon riots, which take, care, take place in London. So anti-Catholicism you know, is, is very much strongly in, entrenched in, 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 uh, in British, uh, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the British uh, sense of, of who they were. Um, uh, then, well, anti-French, we already, we know, there we go. So I mean, those two are already linked along with the absolutism and uh, resist anti-absolutism uh, and anti-Catholicism. Uh, and then last, you know, there's a, and this sort of, these, all these things are linked. I mean, you could do these little, one of these little boxes they do in sociology or political science and have these arrows running all over the place and, and, and you could ma make it uh, there. But, but what, who are the biggest trading powers uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in Europe? Uh, we forget about the, 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 about the enormous trading vitality of Asia even at the at sea vitality and, and land vitality at the same time, but are without any question by this point, with the decline of the Spanish Empire, which begins before this course, uh, are the Dutch and, and the English. And so what this does is it, it increases you know, the role of this commercial uh, middle class, it increases the role of cities, particularly port cities, of which Amsterdam is, uh, and it, it increases their uh, the, the role of these economic elites or their concern with maintaining their privileges against threats to their privileges and to their prosperity no matter where they come from. So you could, you know, just have to amuse yourself, not for any kind of you know, punitive think about the exam exercise, but it'd be fun to sort of take these categories and think about these other countries. Uh, particularly those were absolute states, other large important states in Europe and see to what extent you have these factors there. Prussia, I already said, Prussia, you've got your big, big nobles, you've got all these guys with dueling star, uh, scars, and, and, and uh, for them to, to be indulging in commerce is just sort of you know, crass and, and, and not terribly manly and all this business. Uh, and you've got, your, you've got your, your flute playing king of uh, Frederick the Great, who could be awful, you know, could lash out and, and you know, Voltaire went and hung out with Frederick the Great, and after a while he said, let me out of here. Uh, uh, but you've got, you've got Berlin, which was a very important town, but it's a very important town, a very important city because it's got this huge garrison and it's got factories turning out military uniforms uh, and it's got, the, it's got Potsdam Palace and all of this. Uh, 
Uh, so it's not at all the same thing as Amsterdam or London or uh, any of the other trading cities uh, ar around. Uh, uh, well, the case of, 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 of uh, Russia is even easier. You've got a practically non-existent uh, middle class. You've got all sorts of nobles, uh, and they do are involved in, you know, in commerce. Some of them are, but mostly th what they do is they serve the state. They're called a service nobility. They're not serving the cities. They're not serving you know, commerce. What they're doing is they're serving the state. They're serving this huge you know, lumbering uh, strange guy, uh, uh, Peter the Great. And then you could take other places like Italy and, 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 and you know, smaller, smaller cities, but you don't yet have these big state structures. So if you're looking back, say, from the end of the 19th century, it's kind of, it's not easy to see, but you can see these, these you know, you don't ever think that history runs on railroad tracks and, and all you need is the timetable to show when modernization shows up. That's the most ludicrous uh, word, really, in, in contemporary uh, uh, social science. Uh, or Orthodox Marxists, where you just had to say, well, eventually you know, the proletariat will rise up because the bourgeoisie did this uh, uh, before. But yet, when you look back from the 19th century, these factors do count in explaining how countries uh, uh, turn out to be the way they are. And, and when you're trying to look at the origins of World War I, I mean, it mattered that, 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 that uh, Germany is run by this kind of madcap doofus, uh, uh, you know, Wilhelm II, who was intellectually lazy and, and, and uh, uh, liked to, you know, break uh, bottles of Riesling over a, a bright, shiny battleship. And, and, and didn't concentrate on things very long and sends off uh, you know, provocative telegrams here and there to make everybody mad. I mean, that, that has a long run uh, outcome, which you know, costs the lives of millions of people. But, but uh, so anyway, here we go. I mean, but it's just, it's kind of fun to think about that. So that's what we were doing. We were thinking about that. Now, now let's, let's, tr let's dim the lights. Here we go. How do we dim the lights? I can't remember how you dim the lights. Is that what you do? Oh, well, that's good. Okay. Oh, no, that's not good. Here, we got to get further down than that. Hey, oh, all right. So, it's the lecture. Okay. Now let's um, paralleling what 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 uh, you've been been reading. Let's. Oh, oh thanks. Let's look a little bit at the Dutch Republic, because people talk about England and Britain all the time. And, and uh, so let me uh, talk about the Dutch Republic. And this will kind of bring some of these factors together, along with the idea of how, what people thought they were. What is their identity? And here, again, we'll look at some paintings. And you're not responsible for these paintings. But we'll kind of illustrate ways in which the du Dutch Republic and their social structure and what they emphasized and who they thought they were was very different than, for example, La Belle France. Um, so uh, here we have Amsterdam. Uh, and, and so Amsterdam, you know, it, uh, it grows dramatically because of this global trade in, uh, in, in, in the 17th century. And uh, that was 1613. I mean, this, this is all a bunch of jumble, but, but this is, you know, 1640 or something like that later. Um, but what you have are these canals, and many of you or some of you have had the good fortune to go to one of Europe's most wonderful cities. And, and, and you know, the canals were used to transport goods, and thus the city structure itself, the way this, the, the city was built, or with houses along the canals, reflect the economic primacy of global trade. I mean, at this time, the Dutch are sending herring, these long sort of flat boats, herring ships are going all the way to Newfoundland uh, you know, in the 17th century in Iceland, freezing off the coast of Iceland. And they control and dominate the, the Baltic trade, and herring is an important part of that, because herring will keep once it's, it's salted and all that. So the city of Amsterdam, Amsterdam grows up not only as part of the struggle, victorious struggle, against uh, uh, the Spanish uh, 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 Spanish armies. There's a wonderful book by my uh, 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 former uh, uh, colleague Jeffrey Parker called The Spanish Road, which talked about how difficult it was for the Sp Spanish to get troops all the way to the, to, uh, the Netherlands. I mean, they had to go from, from Italy, because much of Italy was controlled by Spain, through the Alps, all the way up along the Rhine, and finally get it into, uh, get into uh, uh, the Dutch Republic. And it, it, was a, it was a losing battle. But you know, Amsterdam uh, reflects this kind of primacy of, of, of the global economy. Uh, because it's such an important trading power, uh, but also this sort of federalist, decentralized aspect that I've tried to uh, uh, 
uh, tried to d describe. Uh, this is the you know the ship. This is the shipyard behind. In fact, this building in the behind is still there. I did a uh, well. I go to Amsterdam uh, not frequently, but I've been there f you know ten or twelve times or something. I did a Yale trip there. I mean, we took a, you know all these alumni around to look at look at all this stuff, and that was mildly fun. Um, but the the. What, what, the, what the Dutch did, I mean, the, the, the Netherlands is an is extraordinarily small country, um, and it's the most populated country in Europe then, uh, per square kilometer, and is now uh, at once. And so what they try to, what they have to do in order to, you know, in order to feed the population, you have to have more land. Now, how are you going to get more land? One of the incredible things, if you're driving, say, from Groningen and you're going to go all the way down to Amsterdam, when you drive along the coast, you know, you're driving along this, this sort of road that's, that's out in the sea, and, and all the land between the water on, both, on the left side of you and a long, long way has been reclaimed from the sea. So this is in the 17th century. I mean, this isn't sort of scuba diving now off you know, the, the Great Barrier Reef or something like that. I mean, so what they're doing is they're reclaiming the land from the sea. Uh, now, what this has to do with global uh, economy is that you have to be able to feed the population. And so they have, along with the English, and these two facts are related, an agricultural revolution. They have an agricultural revolution, uh, uh, investment in commercialized agriculture, an increase in, the popu in, in production in rural areas. And in the case of the Netherlands, it's because of this. I'll talk about why it happened in, in Britain another time. It's because they reclaim land. How much land do they reclaim from the sea? Well, 36,000 acres just between 1590 and 1615. So that's a phenomenal amount. And they keep going over and over again. And so the population of the Dutch Republic increases between 1550 and 1650 to almost 2 million people. And this is in a pretty small, I mean, it's bigger than Belgium, but it's, this is a pretty small uh, a, a territory. Um, and so Amsterdam, um, by, mid, uh, by mid 17th century, by 1650, uh, increases to 150,000 uh, people. So they build these three large canals, and this, this expands uh, the uh, the, the area of the city by four times. And what this means is that, the, that, that merchants, uh, that boats can dock outside these kind of big warehouses uh, and can unload, or uh, depending on the case, uh, load uh, uh, goods. Um, and so uh, you have 500 uh, miles of canals dug just in the middle decades of the 17th century. So it becomes a sort of economic dynamo uh, uh, because of that, and, and Dutch traders are to be found uh, everywhere. In the 1630s, there are 2,500 trading ships, uh, and uh, they become the principal supplier of grain and fish uh, in, in Europe, and the Dutch uh, dominate the Baltic, uh, uh, Baltic uh, uh, trade. I mean, cities like Gdansk, which we tend to you know, uh, uh, forget about, unfortunately, which is a very you know, important uh, port uh, then and, and still now, and it's where solidarity began too, as many of you know, in, in, in 1980, uh, is an important, uh, important port uh, in all of this. And, and they reached the West Indies, uh, or the East Indies in the 1620s and the 1630s. So they bring back uh, cinnamon, nutmeg, and, and all sorts of, uh, uh, in so all sorts of valuables. And it's this kind of wealth that allowed them to fight this long, hard war of independence, which they finally, uh, they finally win. Now, why is this in here? Now, this is Rembrandt, as most of you know. This is, uh, this is called the Night Watch. Uh, and the importance of this painting is, is who's being painted, and more than that, who is, is getting Rembrandt to paint this? And you know, if you go down into France, if you, if you go to uh, uh, Ma Belle France, if you go to, to uh, there, I mean, the, the painting is dominated by nobles who want pictures of themselves. Uh, or the, you know, the, the, the uh, tiresome sun king. Uh, and, and all this sort of you know, miserable hangers-on, uh, very rich miserable hangers-on. And what, who, what the Dutch, Dutch painted, what Dutch painters painted, uh, reflects in the same way that Renaissance art reflected you know, what, what was important to Renaissance Italy, uh, who, who did the commissioning of painting. I, I care about that. My mother was a painter. She was a portrait painter. That's how we, that's how we survived uh, uh, in Portland, Oregon. Um, uh, what, who commissioned these paintings and, and what, they, what they painted tell you who these people thought they were. So that's pretty interesting. So who are these? This is the Night Watch. These are the guys who run Amsterdam. Uh, these, this is uh, essentially the, 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 town, the town hall uh, of Amsterdam. 
Uh, and, and in fact, that building itself, which I don't have a slide in it, you know, it's extremely modest. It looks so terribly different than, than, than anything, uh, uh, the Spanish palace outside of Madrid or, or, or anything that ever had anything to do with the, 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 the uh, pr uh, Prussian kings or, and, and all that. Well, it's pretty obvious. Um, so this is, this is the weighing house. And here, this is very classic. I'm not a professor of architecture, but it's obvious this is northern European architecture that you can see in northern France, cities like Arras and other places, or charleville mezieres in the Ardennes is one of the most fabulous places anywhere, or in the Place des Vosges, which is by far the most beautiful place in Paris. Uh, you have this, this kind of architecture, but this is the weighing house there. And so, I mean, the buildings, and here's another one. Uh, and so the buildings are the most important buildings in the cities are not huge over-the-top Baroque churches, uh, such as the Jesu in Rome, for example. They are weighing houses. They are things that, uh, and the town hall is of very modest proportions. And, and because it's Calvinist, I mean, Calvinists weren't exactly, uh, the French called rigolo, weren't exactly, you know, wild, fun-loving types. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, even the churches are, are completely denuded of, of the kinds of Baroque uh, swooning cherubs and, and clutter that, that you found in, in beautiful, I'm not knocking the broke, but beautiful churches or in building, in, in Vienna is a good example of that, or anywhere is a good example of that, my God. Um, and here's another weighing house. This is in Gouda, as in the cheese, but the town of Gouda. So Amsterdam wasn't alone. Now here, these are houses that were built along the canals. And so you've got these warehouses along the canals. And here's where the bankers, the, the Dutch had the most, along with the English, uh, the most sophisticated banking system in the world. Uh, uh, the Lloyds of London. Uh, which now does things like, you know, uh, insure quarterbacks' knees and things, uh, but it begins in, in the 18th century uh, when people go into the docks and say, look, uh, we want to, because a lot of these, sh these ships go blub on the way back or are taken by, by pirates and stuff like that, and so well, we'll, we want to insure this ship. Will you sign up for 10% of the value of this insurance? And that's how Lloyd's of London starts. But you had the same thing in, in, in the equivalent in Amsterdam as well. And you, got, the, you have access to capital by these guys, those guys, they're no longer there, the middle class guys behind the, behind the screen uh, who are going to invest in these long you know, tracks. You send off a, a ship to, to Newfoundland or to Iceland or, 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 or even to the Mediterranean. They start getting to the Mediterranean and that scares the hell out of, out of, out of, the, uh, out of their commercial rivals. So, but you build these also houses for people to live in and because there's not a lot of room between the canals, that's why they're so steep when you walk up these things. I mean, it's really, it's almost like that. It's this incline and they seem to be reaching toward the sky there, but not reaching toward the sky as in a, you know, as in the cupola of a Baroque church where you're supposed to see God at the top. Here they're trying to they look up and they see money at the top or, or whatever. But, but uh, I mean, they were religious as well, but it was a different kind of, of religion. And, and here, uh, this is a, you know, a more modern example with a little, little, little uh, you know, hash cafe next to it or something, but this is Rembrandt's house. Uh, um, and, you know, he, he had to live somewhere and that's where he lived because he paints these people. And Rembrandt did have one time where he started painting kind of Catholic themes, but basically he's like these other guys. Uh, they're painting, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute, but they're, they're painting middle class life in the Netherlands. Uh, and they don't do big battle scenes. You have to go to the southern Netherlands or Belgium for that or into France. Uh, so that's, that's what they do. Uh, and that's, that's, what, that's what they look like. That's pretty obvious. Um, this is uh, an orphanage. They had, without question, uh, the most sophisticated charitable institutions anywhere. In fact, we know what, what they ate. They're, it was the most prosperous country for ordinary people anywhere. The diet here, we know what they ate in their meals. Uh, they ate much better than, 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 uh, uh, than poor people did uh, almost anywhere else. Indeed, some ordinary workers bought paintings uh, by, by uh, uh, Stein and, and all sorts of these other, these, these other people. Uh, and here is uh, a workhouse. This is a, is a prison, basically. Uh, they were organized for that, too. Now, one shouldn't, eh, you know, th it was the place of tolerance, there's of toleration. There's no doubt about that. And during the Enlightenment, lots of the Enlightenment, uh, uh, the works of the philosophes that could not be published in France were published in Switzerland, more about that another time, and in the Netherlands. But they could lash out. They lashed out at gays sometimes, they lashed out at Catholics sometimes. Uh, you know, they, 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 there was an edge to them, as if the whole thing could collapse on their heads. This is Simon Schama is not the only person who made that point, others have as well. 
perhaps because of, it, it, because of the big floods. If the dike goes, here's the image of the Dutch boy with his finger in the dike. If the dike goes, you are drowned. Uh, and there's this whole sense that, that, that the thing is precarious, and you better kind of mind your, mind your P's and Q's or whatever the expression is, uh, and, 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 and act very good, very, be, be a good person, or this whole thing could kind of be literally flooded away. Um, now, how different that is than this modest estate. Uh, Versailles. I worked in the archives in Versailles, uh, in the smallest stables. Uh, you know, this is one of my least favorite uh, 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 palaces. But it's just, I mean, the way the Dutch thought about themselves is a little different than the way that the French nobility or the Spanish nobles, at least of the higher ranks, thought about themselves as well. And I, I show these, these are obvious, but just to put them in comparison with what we'll see in the middle. A little modest bedroom there in Versailles. Uh, well, uh, this is, this is uh, uh, the war room, it's called, the Salon de Guerre. Uh, I, mean, I don't like Versailles, what the hell. And this is Vaux le Vicomte, which is much more interesting. I just put this in because I like it, but it shows you, you know, th there are chateaus, in the, there were chateaus in the Netherlands, but they were mostly in the east. There were nobles had the chateau, and, and they didn't dominate, they didn't rule. Uh, uh, this, Vaux le Vicomte was, was fabulous, and Louis XIV uh, was invited by um, his treasurer, a man called Fouquet, to go and eat there, and he was insanely jealous. Uh, they served him on, uh, on gold plates with gold silverware, and he had a huge pond stocked with not only freshwater fish, but saltwater fish. And he was so jealous that he threw him in the slammer, threw him in jail, and confiscated it. But, but the, the, the image is just that this is very different, and the paintings you found there were very different. Here's Rembrandt himself. Can, we, is there, can, you, can you cut the light a little bit? Do you know how to do that. I'm, I, there's somewhere, there's a missing thing here. It might be, missing thing might be in my head. I don't know. But where the hell do you do this thing? Is anyone there? No, I, I'm going, I don't know. But uh, thanks. That was Rembrandt. That was quick. But here's what, just, here's, <laughs> here's, <laughs> he's still there. He, he did about narcissism, he did something like 70 self portraits. Uh, he was his own favorite uh, subject. But anyway, um, uh, my mother tried to paint me, but I never hold still long enough, and so there's only sort of two half uh, finished uh, portraits of me. But anyway, what did people paint? Ruisdale, this, don't write this down, but Ru well, you can if you want, but go to the great museum in Amsterdam and see it, the Rijksmuseum. Ruisdale, you know, painted, you know, ordinary people living uh, and uh, at work, uh, uh, and uh, this is the, uh, this is these are windmills, obviously, um, and here are windmills with people. The same thing, but this is if you wouldn't find these sorts of, generally, these, these kinds of paintings in, in, in other places. This is a painter called Franz Hals, H-A-L-S. Uh, it's a family scene. These are middle class people having paintings, commissioning paintings of themselves. You know, it's the equivalent of, of sort of fancy patricians in, in Florence having paintings of themselves, but they're from a very different social class, uh, the, the patricians of Florence were, or of Venice. Uh, and, and so it, it, it's just, this is sort of set the theme. I love still lives, especially if they have food and wine. And this how, this is, uh, there's some wine up there. This is uh, Pietro uh, Klaas, uh, uh, probably mispronounced, C-L-A-E-S-Z. Uh, and this is still lives. They paint food. They paint, paint food and people eating and people having fun. Not people at war uh, and not uh, people, not the, the sort of, it's 18th century paintings of, the inevitable paintings of the British nobles uh, or land big gentry uh, looking over the, all of the villages they've had knocked down so they could expand their hunting uh, a terrain or, or, or fondling the nose of their killer hunting dogs or something like that. It's just a very different way of imagining oneself. And I mean, it's very attractive. I must find that's very, very attractive. This is the village school. They had the highest literacy rate uh, in the world. Point, period. Uh, the Dutch did. Uh, very, very ordinary people, and there were poor people in the Netherlands. N nonetheless, were very ordinary, uh, literate poor people. And, and there's something to be said for that. And I, I like cats a lot, I hate dogs. But anyway, so this is just a, you know, a children playing with a cat. My, my cat yesterday actually undid my password last night, uh, my Yale password. I saw the thing that said that it said password, and the next I knew she had literally typed, eradicated my password, I put a new one. This has nothing to do with anyone, so I should take this out. But anyway, uh, <laughs> cat, cat, there we go. Or boule, this is what we do in the south of France. It's a little Chardonnay à côté. We play, we play boule, the, you know, you don't, it's not quite the same thing. That's like bocce, we have this sort of metal ball, and that's another, for another lecture. But anyway, rien uh, va avec. Uh, but see, these are ordinary people having fun. Here they are. Here they're having fun. <laughs> yeah. But see, they're, they're having too much fun. 
And this is part of the point, because part of this certain veteran Calvinism and part of the kind of fact that, that what if the dams burst? Or what if the British begin to outdo us in the World Trade Department? Or what if the French come and squish us like grapes? There's always this sense of vulnerability. And behind the paintings of people eating, the theme of people eating or praying prayers at mealtime and this sort of thing, or playing boule, you know, pétanque, bachi, there's always this sense of the ribald family. That's what this is called by Stein, S-T-E-E-N, that, uh, that if you have too much fun, things will get away from you. And these people are all, all, all drinking and leaving these poor little children to their own device. And they may be knocking down one or two themselves there because nobody's paying any attention. You could go too far. And then you end up like this. And then how do you, does it all end up in the long run? Well, how it ends up in the long run for the Dutch is that the Dutch cease to be a great power. But there's nothing wrong with that. They will go on to live highly uh, you know, prosperous lives. Uh, they eventually end up with a monarchy. Uh, they eventually lose Belgium in 1831. Uh, they basically uh, didn't care. Uh, the Dutch economy, rather, the, the equivalent would be the Venetians, uh, the decline of the Venetian uh, uh, economic power in the Mediterranean uh, and in tra trade with, uh, uh, with the East, uh, it diminishes. Uh, 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 the Netherlands uh, ceases to be a, a, a great power whereas England uh, becomes, and Britain, as it becomes in 1707, becomes uh, the biggest of the world powers. But let us still remember these six factors, or seven, or how many I had up there, and, and remember what these two places had in common. It has a lot to do with the global trade, it has a lot to do with social structure, it has a lot to do with, with who they thought they were, the paintings they bought, the paintings they commissioned, the way they viewed themselves, uh, and part of this re- constructing of national identity often has as much to do as who you're not. Not absolute, not Catholic, not French, as it do, does with, you know, with who you imagine yourself to be. And in the growth of, of national awareness, that itself is an important theme. Have a great weekend. See you on Monday.